Of all the craft practiced by the settlers, perhaps the most basic was that of making pottery. The essential materials were literally right under their feet. Even today, the fascination with making something beautiful and practical directly from the rich red clay of Pennsylvania riverbed sparks the imagination. The, the pottery was actually started because of my love of old redware and I collected old redware since I'm very young. My grandmother started me collecting old redware. She had a, um, an antique shop in Lidditz and had redware in it. And my family was sort of connected to crafts through my great-grandfather, who was the town tinsmith, so I had a little bit of a craft background. My father was still working in tin, and I knew a little bit about tin working, but I was real interested in the clay. And I went away to college, and when I went to college, which was an art school in Philadelphia, I discovered I really liked pottery a lot. But I never took any courses there. I just continued to collect the old redware, and Back in the late 50s, 59, 60, I started to just dig a little bit of clay and make it for fun. And I was still in college. I started to teach in a local school district here right after that. And then I started to make a few pieces and so sold them in a few of the local historic societies. Um, the Effort of Cloister and Effort was one of them in the Landis Valley Farm Museum. And it was pretty simple redware at first. They were simple dishes and candle holders and plates and as it grew I, I started to collect more and more of the decorated ware myself and people asked me to decorate it and it, it was a little bit slow at decorating at first. Most of it was plain and eventually I started with the first things was just the slip trailing which is just making the lines on the plate or making a bird or a tulip with a slip cup which is a liquid clay. That's what slip is. And then that grew and in, in, into the 70s when I was doing quite a bit of that and in 70, 71 I did my first piece of scraffito which is a piece covered with clay, completely covered with clay and then the decoration is scratched through it. And that piece, um, I don't know exactly where I sold it but I sold the first piece and recently it came back to me through an auction house which is a real interesting cycle. Uh, after all the years of doing the pottery I'm now sort of collectible and the early pieces have started to show up at all the local antique markets and also a lot of the dealers collect they'll sell early faults which is strange when you're still making pottery and have no intention of stopping at this point. Turning on the wheel is my favorite part. If I had to do anything, if I had to pick one part of all of this that I had to do that would be it. It's probably the most demanding part of all the uh, of all the, the, the pottery making, the, the, the skill involved in the decorating, you, you have that and you have the skill involved in the sculptural part, but when you sit down with a piece of clay and you know that you can have control over your hands enough to make what's in your head, and after all these years I can make pretty much what I want to make. I, I still challenge myself and we make some very unusual things every year and I just recently saw some pieces, old pieces, 200 year old pieces that gave me another inspiration and I, I got inspired at the Mercer Museum in Doylestown over the weekend, seen that collection many times and just saw a few pieces I'd never really looked at before. It's just something clicks with me every time I see it. And uh, unfortunately I, I, I'm not a big collector but I love to collect old redware and when I see old pieces and and find old pieces and think that somebody had that same feeling 200 years ago of coming to this area and digging clay out of the ground and throwing it on a potter's wheel, I, I somehow connect with that and it's a nice feeling. I, I, I'm real interested in preserving the craft and, and having it continue. The, the potters um, that worked in this area 200 years ago, a lot of them evolved and evolved shapes and things that were uniquely their own and I think that's one of my goals is to have things that look like like my pottery. Most, most of the potteries working today they do they aren't just copies of old pieces which is something I don't like to do. I don't like to copy old pieces but they're inspired by old pieces so I feel like I'm continuing that tradition. Now the big difference is the redware potters that worked in this area 150, 200 years ago were utilitarian potters and they made things to store food in and they were real important for that. Now, a lot of people use our pottery for food. They put food on it. I make sets of dishes and I make um, 
crocks and jugs and things like that, but they're not used in the same way. And basically, there are people collect them, they make collections of them, and they make collections of our work. So it gets into sort of the artist type area too, that they're collecting not only the, the redware, but the, the pottery. But it's still a tradition, and I think the old potters sold, I think when I see some of the artistic work of the later ones, especially, they, they, they did things that were a little more artistic, which were a little more collectible, and probably for that same reason. Uh, people collected them rather than just bought them to put, put uh, apple butter in or something like that. When I first became interested in pottery, it was not to sell pottery. It was to learn how it is made. How did they do this? How did they go about it? What are the steps involved? And once I had figured this out, why, of course, we had to try it. And uh, when we first started, we dried the stuff. We did it in the dining room table, and we put this on top of the cupboards in the dining room to, to dry so that the, our children wouldn't you know, break them by chance. And, and we just did it for fun and made some presents for people and thought, okay, we're going to learn this one of these days and, and uh, maybe we'll make baskets or something. Well, I said, maybe I'm a slow learner, but I'm still trying to figure out how to do this. Well, the one plate that I like so much, maybe we'll show it later, is um, around the outside, in German, I'm translating for you. Um, this dish is made of earth and clay, and man is also made thereof. Now, to me, that's a very appropriate text for a dish, and uh, I like it very much, and we use it mm, fairly often. Others were a little bit bragging, uh, out of the earth with understanding. A potter makes everything by hand. I tend to translate it as most everything, because let's face it, you can't make some things out of clay, although an awful lot were. People are starting to want to have a link with the past if it's their past necessary or not, as you mentioned. But um, another thing is that, you know, things are getting so, to me, impersonal, uh, this email and all this stuff, that people can come here and buy a piece, talk to me and my great helpers, and find out exactly how they do it. Uh, I'm not trying to be smart, but you know, these are the hands that did that. <laughs> And, and here they can relate to someone. Um, people will drive from many states away or fly to come to pick up something at, at our annual party or open house type thing. And what happens is that they go away with, they've had a brush with, almost a brush with the distant past, almost I said. And they're able to relate to, here's a pod shop, here's a couple guys doing their thing, so to speak, although it's not exactly ours, it's sort of a, we sort of own part of the past, I guess, or transmit part of the past. But people can relate to this, you know, you go to the store and there is a million of these plates and you can buy as many as you want and you look in the back and you're still not sure what country they came from or anything about how they were produced, besides being stamped out or whatever. And here you have one that starts from, you know, the word go, the ground, the earth, and you end up with something that is durable, can be useful. The flower pots in particular, of course, you need flower pots, so why not have a little fancier one than just a, a regular pot? And, and people really relate to that, I think, and if they can meet the person that, or persons that are doing the thing, and um, even though they may themselves not want to make it, they'd like to know how you went about it. How does this thing work? People will, will spend many, many hours uh, talking to people, here's how you do it, here's what, what you do, and, and if you want to try it sometime or whatever, you know, and 